<clears throat> thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that introduction. I'm absolutely not going to talk about Brexit. <laughs> um, safe to say that I'm delighted to be away from it for a day. Um, you're, you're right, we're doing a lot of work with Lola, who was here yesterday on the all-party parliamentary group on sport, modern slavery, and human rights. Uh, this is a really interesting um, opportunity to focus on governance and uh, anti-corruption and really look at the, the two agendas, the human rights agenda and what it can learn from the anti-corruption agenda and vice versa and where they should overlap and where they should um, uh, remain um, in parallel. Uh, I'm not going to do anything more but, because we've got such a, a good panel, but introduce the panel. They'll speak for about five to seven minutes each. Um, we'll wait until they've spoken and then we'll have full engagement, I'm sure, with everybody here on questions and any comments that you'd like to make. So we're going to start with um, Nicola Bonucci, who is Director for Legal Affairs at the OECD. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, you are escaping from Brexit discussion. I'm escaping from budgetary discussions. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, the two are very often related. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Corruption and human rights, um, that's a, an interesting topic for a, a full two, two days conference. And I have seven minutes. Uh, so I will try to um, go with you towards what OECD has been done, doing in both areas and where I can see the uh, synergies and, and while recognizing the difference. First, um, the basic assumption is that when there is corruption, there is somewhat uh, a human right uh, attack, even though sometimes uh, the victim doesn't know. <laughs> uh, and this is one of the specificity of the corruption because it's not, it's not apparent. And when there is a human right uh, uh, attack, when there is an attack to human rights, it's very often fueled and facilitated by corruption. So there, there is an organic a, a, a link, which doesn't mean necessarily that two issues are, have to be completely merged and, 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 and overlap because I don't think this will help facilitating the intellectual discussion. So the OECD has been working on those two areas uh, from two different angles. First, on the anti-corruption uh, angle, uh, the OECD was at the origin of what is known now as IPAX, which is the International Partnership Against Corruption in Sport, which is a partnership which stems from the London Summit uh, in 2016 on anti-corruption. And the idea was at the time that there were a number of declarations, there were a number of statements, there were a number of um, policy uh, papers on corruption but there was no real organized collective action on corruption. And we uh, therefore decided to group three multi-stakeholders. You will ask me why only three, and I, I will certainly respond later. Um, the three multi-stakeholder groups are governments, international sporting organization, and um, intergovernmental organization. So we established IPAX, which has a, as a focus the idea that we needed to not talk so much about it, but do something about it. So the question is not, you know, if uh, to fight corruption, but how. And we did that through the establishment of task forces, which in terms of reference agreed by the, uh, by the coalition, and they are available in the room. One dealing with uh, integrity in uh, public procurement, the second one dealing with conflict of interest, in particular uh, with the de sorry, designation of the um, host uh, with a f particular focus on conflict of interest, and the third one on internal governance. IPAX uh, has been meeting since February 2017, so it's really an infant still. But I have to say that, uh, again, in, in, in uh, relative terms, li given the difficulty of having um, uh, to, of doing anything collectively, um, it, it's, it's really remarkable what we have achieved. We had our uh, first high-level meeting in London last week, and in which uh, the three uh, task forces reported on progress made, and there are already a set of recommendations 
available, which will be uh, publicly available in the next few days. And you will see that they are really trying to be very concrete recommendations uh, with also toolkits that we would like to develop in 2019. So we are looking at this issue of corruption through this coalition, which is what we need in terms of uh, top-down, but with a working method which is very much based on let's not try to establish standards. There are many standards. Let's try to uh, do something practical that international sporting organization and national federation uh, can implement. The second angle and why the OECD was keen in doing that is because the OECD has a lot of experience on the fight against corruption in general and that there is a lot that international sporting organizations can learn from good practices in the corporate world and in the public sector. The second initiative uh, is probably most well known in, in this room, so I will not spend so much time, but it's a very important one, uh, is NATO, the guidelines for multinational enterprises, which again is the first, uh, uh, the oldest, and the sole intergovernmental uh, agreement uh, on responsible business conduct, uh, really agreed at the level of the governments. What is important in the guidelines is that um, they have a number of chapters. The chapter on human rights was added following the adoption of the United Nations Guiding Principles and is very much uh, related to that. But what makes the added value of the guidelines is that <laughs> even though the guidelines are voluntary and are recommendation to companies, there is a binding mechanism for governments which is to establish what we call the national contact point, which is an institution or a person which is in charge of dealing with complaints um, for non-compliance with the guidelines. Uh, and you could tell me, well, the guidelines are dealing with responsible business conduct, so uh, international sporting organizations are not for profit, so they are not really uh, go governed or covered by that. Actually, the matter is much a bit more complicated. And in fact, in a, in a landmark ruling a couple of years ago, uh, the National Contact Point of Switzerland indicated that some of the uh, activities of FIFA in relation to the World Cup were to be treated as business. And clearly, we all know that international sporting organizations uh, have a component of not for profit, but there is also a business component, which also explains why the OECD was involved. So I will stop here, and if you want to know more, you will have to ask questions. Um, thanks very much indeed, Nicola. I can pass um, straight on to Andy Spaulding on my right here, and he's Professor of Law at University of Richmond and well known to many of you. Thank you very much. Uh, great to be here, and let me just say uh, what a thrill and a relief it is to be in a country, visiting a country that's moving in the right direction on corruption, as opposed to, well, one example that comes to mind is my own country. Uh, it's always a little bit awkward, but refreshing to, to speak to audiences such as this. Uh, we might define human rights as that to which all persons are entitled simply by virtue of being human, the violation of which is a grave affront to justice. Now, many of the particular rights that we would discuss and have uh, enshrined in the documents in the conventions uh, have proven quite divisive uh, internationally, but there is one principle on which every tradition of political thought that I have ever seen agrees, which is that persons entrusted with public authority ought not to abuse it for private gain, which is the definition of corruption. I think, it's, I think the anti-corruption principle is as close as we have to a truly global political norm, and so I think there's a deep affinity between the anti-corruption movement uh, and human rights, and it's proper and fitting that we discuss these. Now, sports are not even close to the world's worst uh, uh, manifestation of corruption, um, but corruption in sports might be among the most visible manifestations in the world, nearest and dearest to the hearts of many. How many people in the world are familiar with the FIFA investigation vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, Operation Lava Jato in Brazil, which is probably the most important anti-corruption enforcement uh, action in history, I suspect FIFA wins that poll. Uh, people care about sports, and 
historically, uh, organized sports, mega sporting events have been a symbol of what many people in the world today still believe, which is that corruption is uh, entrenched, endemic, and is absolutely inherent in human society. But I think we're approaching the time now when sports can represent something altogether different. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, I think in 2017, just last year, um, something of a pivot point occurred. Three events converged to create what I think is a, is a special and unique uh, moment in the history of sports governance. Let me explain what I mean. The first event um, is that the International Olympic Committee inserted two new provisions into its model host city contract. One, requiring the National Olympic Committee, the uh, organizing committee, and the host city to adopt anti-corruption compliance measures in the seven year preparation period between winning the bid and putting on the games. The second was uh, a, a parallel clause requiring these same entities to adopt human rights measures. So for the first time in history, the Olympic host would have a con an enforceable contractual obligation to adopt anti-corruption compliance and human rights measures. Now that happened at the IOC level in Switzerland. In France, completely independently, in the same year, France adopts a landmark anti-corruption law, Sapin de, and a landmark uh, corporate human rights law, the duty of vigilance. And notice the parallel structure here. Uh, both in the IOC contract and in France, we have a, a, a important new anti-corruption provision and an important new human rights provision. The third event that also happened in 2017 and that brings these two together is, of course, Paris is awarded the 2024 20, Games. And so a country already swept up in an anti-corruption and human rights movement would quite fortuitously be the country to define what these new contractual obligations mean in practice. France will set the precedent that future hosts will follow. The 2026 host is going to have the same contractual provisions. Uh, the 2028 host, LA, already does have the same contractual provisions and they will both have to look to France uh, to see what these provisions mean in practice. As I have been trying to understand what's already happening in France, I see something going on that I think is unprecedented in, in Olympics, which is you see the Olympics, the hosting of the Olympics, accelerating the implementation of existing anti-corruption and human rights laws. We have this brand new Sapin de, brand new duty of vigilance law, and what we see, and if we had more time, I could document a number of ways where we start to see uh, hosting the Olympics accelerate the implementation of these laws in ways that are extending beyond sport and may well remain in place after the Olympics are over. And if that happened, we could credibly say that the host city is in fact better governed as a result of hosting the Olympics. That the Olympics, having been part of the corruption and human rights problem, are becoming part of the solution. That there is in fact a legacy in the host city of improved respect for anti-corruption norms and human rights, and that we can point to specific ways in which this is uh, occurring with uh, norms, standards, practices, and perhaps, and even in some cases, laws. So I think we are poised to set the first true governance legacy here in Paris with the 2024 games. And I think we will be able to say to subsequent hosts, that this is what Paris has set and this is what now you are expected to do. And if all that occurs and it appears that it is, then we will have, a, we will have seen a new kind of legacy emerge in mega sporting events, a governance legacy, a legacy of improved uh, legal protections for, uh, for human rights and improved legal um, respect or legal measures aimed at reducing corruption. Uh, so some have uh, said, what, what do we think is going to be different a year from now? What can we point to as changes? I hope to offer one modest one, which is that I think from a year from now we will have even more evidence of the way that hosting the Olympics in Paris has accelerated the implementation of anti-corruption and human rights laws in ways that are likely to endure after the games are gone. Thank you. Andy, thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to hand over to Maggie Murphy, um, Director for Public Policy at the Sport Integrity Global Alliance.
Morning, everyone. It's so nice to be on a panel where there's a round, like a, a very positive aspect. <laughs> Often we sit up here and we complain, and I hope now that I won't complain too much. We, um, we Americans will be positive whenever, wherever we can. We'll take every opportunity we can get at this point. Well, I'm British, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a, a brief introduction to SEGA, the Sport Integrity Global Alliance. It's a membership organization composed of a really diverse set of stakeholders. So we have the sports bodies in there, some National Olympic committees. Uh, we also have unexpected groups, maybe like the sports betting companies um, and also sponsors like MasterCard. Um, and we're trying to, I guess, identify some leaders that are willing to take this challenge on and, and, and move us forward. And with those members and with other experts, um, we've set about designing uh, three sets of, of standards, um, one on good governance, one on financial integrity, which looks at things like money laundering in sport, um, and one on sports betting and match fixing, which we haven't heard that much about in the last couple of days. Now, they are designed to kind of break down some of these ambiguous gray things, such as integrity and good governance that sometimes remain a bit abstract. So they break them down into manageable chunks, for different stakeholders, and they're also on a bronze, silver, gold uh, system. So you don't, you might always aspire for gold, but you're probably going to start with bronze and work your way up. And those standards apply to those different stakeholders. So it's not just about the sports bodies, it's not just about governments. But something that was mentioned, when we think about corruption in sports, we do often think about the big scandals, FIFA, um, maybe Salt Lake City, uh, and I really want to bring us back down to earth. About five years ago, I was playing in a football tournament overseas and met a player called Nadia. Nadia um, was a great player. She told me that her team, she played for the best club in our country, they just won the national championship, and she didn't look very happy about it. And I said, you know, what's, what's the problem? She said, well, you know, we got this prize money, we were in the changing room, we were so excited, we, what are we gonna spend on ball, balls, kits, coaches, we needed everything. And then a man from the Football Association came in to the changing room, took the money from them, and said, I'll look after this for you. And they never saw the money again. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, put in contact with the head of women's football in a federation in Africa. And she told me that she has a wonderful title and none of the power. And she talks about how when she asks for money to deliver sport on the ground, the budget line disappears. She, where does this go? And she told me that she's at her wit's end. She doesn't know if she can continue. And she is a leader in that particular community, and we are punishing her through this kind of uh, corruption and siphoning off. And I want to remind us of those types of people, because when we talk about governance and compliance and codes of conduct and conflicts of interest, it can be so dry. One of our challenges, I think, is that governance lacks a personality, and we need to put that personality back into it. And I think that if we do not do that, if we do not address the rot at the bottom, on the local level, in local federations and sports bodies, then we lose the trust of the people who it matters most. We lose the trust of Nadia, we lose the trust of the players, of the fans, of everyone that is actually invested in this game in a real sense, not just in a financial sense. And that is why the human rights sector and the anti-corruption sector need each other. And that's why this center is so important because it really binds everything together and puts that personality back into governance. Now, a second challenge from where I sit, um, and Nicholas mentioned it already, where there is secrecy, there will be corruption, and where there is corruption, there will be human rights abuses. And from where I sit, the sports bodies are so far behind the world in this area. It's, it's shocked me. Um, we talk a lot about corruption in the corporate sector, but actually the sports bodies are so far behind when it comes to normal things around transparency. So let me go back to Nadia. If Nadia had wanted to go back to her federation and ask questions about how much money was in the envelope, how much money was uh, allotted to women's football in that particular case, uh, who was in charge of that, who, you know, where, what, where is 
the activities, what's going on, she would not have been able to find out. And that's because her particular football federation uh, did not release any information on financial records, nothing on activities over the course of the year, nothing on statutes, um, and uh, nothing on uh, their codes of conduct. And I have very intentionally not told you what country Nadia comes from because it doesn't matter. And in my old job at Transparency International, uh, we ran a study, I hope I'm not stealing this from Sylvia, still at Transparency International. Uh, we ran a study at the time to look at all the football federations across the world and find out how much information was being public. Four out of five football associations published no financial records. 85% published no information on, on activities, what they actually did. One in five didn't even have a website. Now, we have to have that kind of information so that people like Nadia and people in this room can actually ask those questions and hold uh, sport, their sports bodies accountable and find out what is actually being done with their money, a lot of which is actually taxpayer funds as well. A last quick challenge, sport is universal. We can all attest to that. And it's also big bucks. We all know that. And that means that whether we like it or not, there are so many different players involved including those sponsors, and including the betting companies, including people we might not normally be in a room with. And whether we like it or not, we try, need to try to get some of those people with different objectives somehow onto the same page. So some food for thought on how to tackle some of these areas. I think that one of the missing things is we need to change hearts and minds around this issue. And so it cannot just be left to be a compliance uh, checkbox exercise. Uh, if you don't know why you have a code of conduct in place or a conflict of interest policy, you're not really going to be looking to implement it. And I think that's uh, one of the other ways to do this is just to connect that grassroots and those people with also the high level forums that all of us here often sit in. And one maybe interesting thing, when Transparency International ran that survey a few years ago, many of the football associates, we contacted them before we published it and we said, you know, we're, we're wanting to know if this information is there. They didn't even know that it, that it should be out there. It wasn't, they didn't realize that that was important. And many of them were very willing, very quickly to put that online. They didn't realize, they hadn't connected these issues. Now, we can try to change those hearts and minds, but we won't succeed with everyone. But I think this room here gets it. But I think this room is not very normal. If you look around, you guys are quite diverse. <laughs> this is a diverse room. You guys get it, but this is not, this is not what, the, uh, what, what the boardrooms look like in sports organizations. This is not what a sports conference looks like. And that means we need to really shake up the representation in those sports organizations, but also in the companies, in the sponsors. I've had many yellow cards in my time, so I'm not too worried. So. Um, so, yeah, so this room gets it. Diversity in all aspects. And please, uh, women, for example, should not just be in the women's department of an organization. We are players and coaches and referees. <laughs> and there'd be a lot more of us if we weren't boxed up into those women's departments. So. Um, and finally, just the basic transparency. We need to have these kind of systems in place. Uh, basic transparency needs to be uh, enshrined across the body. I'm now getting nervous. <laughs> it's more like 90 minutes is coming. Um, and, uh, and there are lots of initiatives out there I can talk more about. Maybe thinking about transparency as having information open by default. So make, you have to make the argument not to publish instead of making the argument to publish. So maybe that's one thing that I'll let you off with. And breaking down silos was one thing I wanted to say, but ask me a question about that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. That's great. <laughs> and finally from um, up here, Sylvia Schenk, who is chair of the working group on sport at Transparency International. Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Let me start with two sentences on my background. I'm a lawyer by profession, an Olympic athlete, and I've been for four years the president of German cycling, stepping back when my board refused to deal with a doping suspicion. And I've been the first and only woman for five years in the management committee of the International Cycling Union. There I have been kicked out when I opposed to 
give privileges to a candidate for the next presidency. So uh, at that time, I didn't call it corruption, and I didn't know that I'm a whistleblower. By opposing it, I didn't even know the words then. But when I was kicked out and when I realized what really happened, then that brought me to Transparency International and working on anti-corruption in sport very soon brought me to working on human rights in sport. So thank you for, uh, at the beginning, uh, to the Center of, for Sport and Human Rights to have this panel because we had some discussions beforehand and I'm happy we have it and I think after what we already heard, you can all agree. And thank you to Sharon Bar Barrow, who really addressed all already corruption this morning. I want to talk on two points. First one, you cannot be successful in protect protecting human rights without bringing corruption, conflicts of interest, and nepotism to a minimum. And the second point, the policies and processes we all need to implement the UN guiding principles, thus protecting and respecting human rights in sport, they need minimum standards, and we already have heard it now, on governance. Otherwise, it will not work. So Transparency International was founded just 25 years ago. It was, and we knew it in the very beginning, that it will be a long time battle, not just to change laws on corruption, anti-corruption, but structures, and above all, culture, the mindset behind it. Because if you don't change that, you will not succeed, whether it's on anti-corruption or on human rights. And so the same just for us here all now. So coming to my first point, the impact of corruption on human rights. We had some examples already from Maggie. And I will start with the sport organization. One point is obvious. If sport officials are corrupted, they take money that should go into the sport. We had an example here, and we just had last week uh, published a decision in an international federation on a continental and national situation where around one million was vanishing and where really we had clear evidence that at least one athlete didn't receive the money she would have needed to prepare for Rio 216. So it really affects athletes on, on all levels. Um, corruption has been used to cover up doping cases, thus damaging the health of ongoing doping with those athletes who have doped, and of course not uh, giving fair competition to those athletes who play according to the rules. They have been paid bribe for the selection for a national team to make a career and then perhaps from an African country be transferred to Europe. There has been corruption with regard to transfers, a lot of corruption in this area, uh, up to human trafficking by corruption. So that's, again, really a big impact on human rights. And we have discussed yesterday in detail quite many and different situations of sexual abuse. Where you have a corrupt environment, where you have people who are fearing to say something, to speak up, to address problems, there, of course, everybody who wants to make sexual abuse has an easy game to play. So it's closely connected. If you really want to eradicate sexual abuse, sexual harassment in sport or any other organization, you have to have an open culture. You have to have people who dare to speak up, to listen not only to victims, but then to act on it. So that's, that's a very important point. Then we have money laundering in sport. It's quite easy to buy a for example, a, a football club in some countries. We have oligarchs doing their image laundering by buying a football club. Well, in the first uh, point, it doesn't do really harm to sport. Well, it undermines sport, but it does harm to the local population. I think that's something we have to take care as well of. But on the long run, it as well does harm to sport. And um, if we would take all corrupt money out of sport, at least in some sports, especially football. There would be some football players, sorry for saying that, that would receive less money. But on the long run, I think it would be more healthy for that sport. So we have a close connection between criminals laundering money and sport, and that undermines everything what we are fighting for. Don't forget that if you talk about corruption and, and human rights. Um, 
Athletes, young athletes, are corrupted by match fixers, destroying their careers. There is a lack of prevention in quite many cases, and then we have as well problems with human rights with regard to the fight against corruption in sport. For example, if you have whistleblower systems implemented, and we have it with doping, with manipulation of uh, sport competition, but with no real protection of the whistleblowers. So then we have maybe even risks for, for life for some of the athletes or, or, or coaches or whoever uses these systems. So that's something we have to take care of. And with regard to sports manipulation, we have sanctions in some federations that are far too serious compared to doping cases. Because one just want to demonstrate, while well, we are doing a lot against sport mani uh, competition manipulation, but it's exaggerating. And if you have no real uh, prevention um, um, systems in, in place, you cannot punish young athletes and destroy nearly their whole life. And I think that's something we have to take care of as well. So that's my first point with regard um, to sport with regard to countries, and they have a, a role to play as well if it comes to major sport events. It's not just that corruption for uh, constructing the facilities for major sport events will take away money from the local uh, population, from local sport on, on the grassroots level, but it will as well um, has an impact on, on the whole situation of, of sport and, and the major sport event. And uh, with regard to example for worker standards, if we have very good standards now on human rights, but we don't have the controls in the countries where the workers are working, if we have corrupted controllers in the countries, we have now a situation that Transparency Bangladesh and Transparency Germany have worked together on the Bangladesh Accord to implement anti-corruption measures because there are standards, there are people who are controlling, but if they are corrupted, and that can happen, and that happens quite often, then the standards doesn't help at all. And it will be the same with whatever standards we set here. If there is a corrupt environment, it will not work. So my second point, we need our, the policies and processes we need for implementing the UN guiding principles in sport need at least a minimum of governance standards. We had already examples mentioned here. We had David Gravenberg as well talking about what he has been doing with regard to governance or is still doing uh, with, uh, within the, the Commonwealth uh, family. Um, if we talk about companies, and, and you did it in, uh, in your presentation. If we talk about companies, we usually think about very big companies if it's about the UN guiding principles. Sport federations are very small. FIFA has around 500 employees. And other international federations, they have less than 100. They are organizing one event after the other. They are trying to get some money to finance it all. And they are are far away from any kind of compliance processes or from reporting on sustainability and from human rights reporting and UN guiding principles. So it's not just to tell them what they have to do and they should understand, but there is a lack of ability and we have to take care of that. And so we really need to have the link between governance issues and, and human rights issues. And if we look onto the national level, national Olympic committees and national federations, even the more lack of all these standards in most of the countries. And so that's something we have to take into account. And we have to think about another point with regarding to structure. We don't have, if we look at FIFA or the IAAF or the FINA, the International Swimming uh, Federation, it's not a top-down situation like you have in big companies. We don't have just to convince the board of managers and the president, and then they just do it and tell every employee what they have to do and roll out a compliance and human rights program. No, they are elected from the national federations. And where are the national federations from? If you look at, on the cor uh, Corruption Perception Index of Transparency International, you have more than 100 countries with huge, huge corruption problems. And who will be the president of the National F Swimming Federation, Athletics Federation, Football Federation? Someone who is very integer and of the highest ethical standard in a country that is all about corruption? 
I don't think so. There are very good people in every country, but they usually don't get the power and not in sport. So if you do, if you just expect on the international level we can have an impact and then everything will follow, no, we have to work on the national fact, uh, um, um, level as well. And I see the yellow card and I'm close to, to, to stop. Um, so the question written we received was whether there is scope for greater alignment between anti-corruption and human rights. It's not the question whether there is scope. There is an urgent need because otherwise no one of us will be uh, successful. And that's why initiatives like um, um, Mr. Bonucci has just talked about, like IPEX, but other initiatives from the National Olympic Committee's organization, from the IOC and from others on good governance should be taken into account. I cannot go to a sport federation today and say you have to do good governance, do all of this, and come one year later and say, well, you have good governance. It's good, but not good enough. Now you please add something on, on uh, human rights. We have to link it together. That's what I started now on the national level. I'm not advising any national sport federation in Germany anymore on good governance without talking about human rights because that's one thing. Good governance without human rights is not good governance. That's what we know today. So what we urgently need is to coordinate all these initiatives because the small federations, and they are nearly all small, will get crazy if they have to do more anti-doping. WADA is coming. Good governance, IOC or IPEX is coming. Anti uh, manipulation and then human rights. They can't do it like that. We have to put it together and what I, and I think Mary, I haven't seen her, what I really recommend for, for the center is um, to take advantage of the ongoing initiatives on good governance and link it to human rights and see how we can use the energies, synergies, how we can use the systems and, and not do it twice or three times. Um, and as I'm a, coming from competition and being a competitor, if it's on Paris 224, I'm going into the competition for Euro 224 in Germany, and that's what we are working on on the national level, to beat Paris or at least together bring the agenda of anti-corruption and human rights to the future. Thank you. It's always good to have a panel where all four of them got yellow cards, which means that we could have easily spoken throughout the whole of um, lunch um, today, and there'll be lots of questions and comments. I'm just going to make a, a few quick observations. One of the fundamental problems, and this comes out of what Andy said, is that sport, international sport, works under a lex sportiva. It works under its own legal system. And where it works under its own legal system, it makes its own rules and it judges its own um, uh, cases in, in the case of the IOC and CAS and um, other sports as well go to CAS. And that's a problem because where that exists, then the level of accountability, the level of transparency and the existence of conflicts of interest all continue. And a classic example um, that um, Andy focused on is this can change if sport and international sport can work with governments. And here in France, it certainly does. In the States, it hardly does. There is the, international, uh, there's the National Olympic Committee, which is actually mandated in legislation. In the UK, there is no sports law whatsoever. I mean, France is a sports law. And, and therefore, where you don't have that, the absence of that is a serious problem and a serious challenge. And picking up also on Nicholas' point, that exists, for example, with WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, where there's recently been an allegation of bullying against the head of the Athletes Commission. I'm going to come on to um, Sylvia's comment on athletes. But what is WADA composed of? It's 50% members of the IOC who depend on the, those votes to go up the ladder of the IOC from countries who are then potentially being um, uh, assessed by WADA for compliance. But you can't do that. That is an absolute clear conflict of interest, as is the other 50%, incidentally, which are governments. Why WADA isn't composed of independent lawyers and independent experts in the world of medicine, 
I don't know. But until it is, you are going to continue to have problems, not exposed by WADA, exposed by the press, as was the case um, uh, following the Winter Games in Sochi. So I think that's an exceptionally important point to, to consider, and it's a, it's a red thread through some of the discussions here. Um, Maggie gave a great um, contribution, as always, and she did touch very briefly on match fixing and sports betting companies. And I hope we don't overlook the huge issue of match fixing and the betting, the multi-billion dollar industry behind betting. And for these guys, we monitored it. I was one of the four people overseeing the, the seven years of the London Olympic Games as president of the National Olympic Committee. And during the Games, every morning we had a meeting to monitor unusual movements in the betting market. Because athletes are the victims, as well as the, the criminal gangs who benefit from that betting. And I'll give you an example. There was a, an African athlete who was offered $20,000 to come fourth rather than third in their heat. Now, for the athlete, it didn't matter because that athlete will have qualified for the final. But for the sports betting or the, those betting behind the scenes, it mattered hugely that he came fourth rather than third. And $20,000 to him was a fortune. And we really have to focus on the impact of um, the match fixing in the sports betting companies. And finally, to Sylvia, um, I don't know if we competed in the same games, but um, it's so important that ultimately this is all about the interests of the athletes. And we need to focus on the athletes and the vulnerable athletes. And sport benefits is a multi-billion dollar industry, and it benefits ultimately because of the athletes. Unless we look after the human rights of those athletes, unless we make sure an anti-corruption agenda is implemented to protect those athletes, they are frequently victims. And I understand yesterday there was um, some examples of that, and again today in the speeches here, um, reference to that. So, those are a few ideas to throw out in addition to the comments that have been made, but it's over to you now. I mean, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and comments that want to come from the floor. Hi, my name is Helen Maroulis. Um, I'm a 2016 Olympic gold medalist in women's wrestling. I'm here today because I love sport and I really believe in its ability to change lives. Um, and I've also seen uh, some of the ways that it can be used uh, not for good and for um, self-gain for the wrong reasons. And so my question for the panel is, um, how, how do you suggest athletes use their platforms to influence mindsets and cultures uh, in a way that helps others and, and how can they best protect themselves in doing that as well, uh, the integrity? Let me take another couple of questions or comments and then the panel can come back at say two or three. I saw it in the second row. Um, Maggie particularly asked um, if we could ask her her views on silos. So um, that, but I, uh, Sylvia definitely addressed that. But if if other members of the panel could actually talk to practical met practical steps to how to go about doing that, that'd be interesting. Thank you. On my right. Um, my name is Shoi Sugiyama, coming from Japan Sports Arbitration in Japan. And uh, my question is: so Recently, we Japan has many many scandal corruption in amateur boxing federation or the harassment in the gymnastics federation. But we, Japan, had no binding standard uh, to the sports federation. So my question to panel is, uh, do each country need the binding code or standard to, to prevent corruption or realize good governance? Andy, do you want to, um, we'll, we'll Pause for a moment and pick up on three quite important themes, um, which could have a lengthy discussion on each of them. Andy, why don't you start both on, um, on the practical steps, but also the binding code point and the, and the, sport, uh, the Lex Sportiva issue that derives from that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so much to discuss here, but just a couple of thoughts. I think on the Lex Sportiva problem, I think um, one of the game changers of the last few years has been the way that national enforcement agencies, particularly criminal enforcement agencies have got involved in sports. I think the FIFA prosecutions were a big deal. I think we, we see uh, the way other governments are brought into this. We've seen lots of criminal prosecutions for sports related corruption in Brazil, in South Korea, and that absolutely has to continue. As, as, as important as it is for sports to have its own enforcement mechanisms, we, those alone are not going to get it done. It's certainly true. Um, uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the silos question, I, you know, I looking at host country 
corruption and the preparations period, there's no question that, that the anti-corruption measures and the human rights measures are being advocated at the same time. And we're lucky that this is happening in France where the, the human rights piece is, is very much culturally salient. If this were occurring in the United States, the anti-corruption piece would get a lot of attention and the human rights piece not that much, probably. Uh, and so uh, I think France is, is, is collapsing this, the silos, and, and, and um, we should be glad that they are. Finally, on the athlete's question, if I could say, this is going to be a counterintuitive answer, but if, if, if I could, um, everybody knows about uh, corruption and human rights violations in FIFA. Everybody, er, the, these stories make the papers. Um, what nobody knows is the things that sports organizations are actually doing to mitigate these problems. There's a success story at FIFA on the human rights piece that uh, is almost embarrassing to talk about because it's so counter to the, the public's expectations of what's going on in these organizations. And we have to have people with credibility talk about these things. I think that will help to change the perception to being one that sports, uh, mega sports and sports governance can become part of the solution and in, are, are now becoming part of the solution. I'll, I'll defer to others. <laughs> Yeah, a, a couple of observations, uh, maybe not more, both responding to the question, but also to your point. Uh, I will challenge you a bit on the L'Exportiva. I don't think the, this is a problem per se. And, and, and I take international organizations, because in a sense, international organizations are, are like international sporting organizations. We are not within the jurisdiction of anybody. But, you know, did, but we put in place, because we had shareholders who care about it, uh, a number of internal control and compliance and, and, and a governance system that makes it that we are not zero risk, but we're certainly uh, well equipped. So I think the Lexportiva has been used and abused in order to justify um, situations which are unjustifiable under any legal system, even an internal legal system, even a, 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 a an international uh, sporting organization legal system, which leads me to, to, to the issue of conflict of interest. In the, co in the context of, of the, this work on IPEX, I, I, I started to realize um, what a big issue is this. Uh, and, I need, and I think we need to be uh, a bit sophisticated because there are parts of the system which are built on conflict of interest and those are not necessarily bad. Conflict of interest is not always, first it is not illegal per se necessarily and sometimes you want conflict of interest or at least you want some interest to be represented. What again is not normal is that those, those are not transparent, they are not managed and they are very much based on private conflict of interest, whereas people confuse, confuse conflict of interest, public uh, and private. But what is striking is the non-understanding from within of the fact that there are three types of conflict of interest. There is a real one, but then there is the, the potential and the apparent conflict of interest. And I think this is where there is a lack of understanding total lack of understanding in a number of uh, international sporting and national federation about potential and apparent. And my last point about um, very interesting discussion that I hear both from uh, um, Maggie and Sylvia on, on this dilemma. I think it's a real dilemma. How can you have a national federation which is clean in a country which is corrupted? I mean, let's be very frank. You know? Uh, I mean, are we not uh, hoping for something that could not uh, happen because of what Sylvia said? I think this is where Andy's point can be very interesting. And I still believe that there is scope for the international sporting movement to become a bit the silent of integrity that, that TI has been promoting in some countries because of the visibility of the sport. Uh, and, and so the Trojan horse that uh, Im image that, that, that um, Andy was using, I think it's an interesting avenue. We'll see if the future will uh, be shine. Sylvia, come um, back particularly on uh, Olympic gold medalist. I got a silver which is scrap metal. 
And uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you come second, you lose. And that's saying with, with a silver medal. So many congratulations to you. But you make an extremely important point about where can the voice of the athletes be properly taken into account rather than just nominally listened to. Um, Sylvia, you might have some specific comments to make on that. Uh, no medal. Um, when Pierre de Coubertin founded the uh, Olympic Committee in 1894, from my perspective, at that time, it was a very different time, so for example, no, no women were a part of it, but it was an act of civil society. And in quite many countries, sport organizations are part of civil society. And we should not accept that there have been some people in some federations that grabbed these initiatives, mm -hmm. taking money, power for their own uh, gain. But um, we have to well, bring back to life civil society thinking within the sport organizations. And that's why I think what um, Nicola said with regard to Lex Sportiva is totally right. Uh, it has been abused. It is abused in, in some areas. We had yesterday Jonas Bear Hoffman talking of uh, the um, dispute resolution uh, system within FIFA, that it's very helpful on the international level, and they have the problems on the national level. So coming back to, to your question, what athletes can do, and not just the high-performance athletes who are sitting in the room, but on all levels, they have to fight for their rights. They have to bring back the thinking of civil society into the sport organizations. And therefore, if we start to have more transparency on the international level, so that on the national level, all people interested in sport, all athletes, high-performance there, or even just starting, and the parents and so on can have a look, what is the money flow to our national federation? And then can see where does it end? With the athlete I have just been talking about who, who didn't receive the money for preparing for, for Rio, if there would have been a possibility to look on the international website, this money is going to this national federation for supporting athletes who are fulfilling these criteria, she would have had the possibility to, to claim the money from the International Federation. She raised questions, even in public, within her country, and she was just put to, to silence. So there is a possibility, and we need the athletes. We need those people interested in sport, and even the, the fans are all over the world. And we can start to work on the international level, and thus empowering the national level. And if we don't do that, we will not succeed. But if we succeed in that, we can even have an impact beyond sport on the countries, on the national level. And that's a big chance, and that's why I've, I'm fighting, fighting for that. Thank you. Oh, quickly on the, on the athletes side of things. Athletes spend a long time just trying to win competitions. Um, I know of a former premiership footballer who told me that you spend all your time trying to get into the first team. Then you're in the first team. You want to stay in the first team. You want to play for your country. You want to play for your country in a World Cup. You want to, and then suddenly you retire. And you're like, oh, wow, I was actually really powerful. I should have spoken up. And that's a massive burden on your shoulders and on their shoulders. I think get rid of that burden. Don't feel guilty because... Um, it's, it shouldn't be down to, to you, but you are powerful. And so I feel like find representation, organize. The players' unions are doing a fantastic job. Being part of that and, and shifting the burden of you as an individual um, is, is really powerful, I think, in that respect. On, on silos, very quickly, last week I was at an EU uh, event on sport integrity. I think I've only seen one or two people here in this room that were in that room last week. I think that uh, Sylvia's vision is uh, really, really strong and bold, but also quite ambitious to try to get everything under one house. Um, I think it's really important, or not under one house, but trying to find uh, that unity, I think it's always going to be difficult. I do think the one thing that might be important is there is a role for different approaches, um, and that I don't think we need to agree on everything as long as we're moving forward. Um, and that some small sports bodies are not going to be able to be helped in the way that big sports bodies are going to be helped. And so there, there is a role for um, that kind of... I think we can be a little bit exclusive sometimes in these big forums, and I think we need to um, try to avoid that and break down the silos instead of build them. 
Um, and then on the, on the question on Japan, on the, on the standards. Um, so the UK now has uh, standards in place which requires uh, any sports body that is getting public funding to have a set of standards in place. It's, you can see that as a carrot or a stick, and some of the national sports bodies have seen it as a stick, and others have seen it as a carrot. Um, maybe it's just the way that you, you frame that. I think that it's fair. If it's taxpayers' funds going somewhere, I think you need to have those basic standards in place on compliance and on corruption and on good governance to make sure that our money is being... Uh, treated, used fairly. So just on that, on the, the SEGA standards is a good way to, to start. It breaks it down into manageable chunks. Um, have a look at that. It's also bronze, silver, gold. And very crucially, it's not just a set of standards. There's also working with the sports bodies to implement because sometimes we can forget that actual action part as well. Maggie, that's great and great advice. Um, well, <laughs> Well, I'm showing myself the red card, but we'll take the four here, the final four questions, and then the panel will quickly respond to them. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question for you guys. I think we checked the box. So I run a charity in Cameroon. The founder of the charity is in the room, and you saw him this morning. He's an athlete. He had a civil society in Cameroon. The Federation of Rugby has been suspended for the last two years because of corruption. By the wall rugby. So we seem to check a box. So we have the athlete, his voice, my voice, and civil society. What else can we do? Near the back. Near the back, there was a second question. Right, it's all yours. Hi, I'm Kristen Morelli from Canada. Um, I'm just going to wear my athlete's hat right now. Um, I just wanted to comment to, I think, more of to what's between Colin and Sylvia in terms of the athlete's position and, and all this and the issues around conflict of interest. I think the issues of conflict of interest are much greater than we, we may like to think. Um, as you may know, I was, I was probably, many, many of the biggest cases of human rights file, um, cases that have gone on in, in uh, sport that have been successful have been outside of the court of arbitration and sports system where it, um, me and a couple of other athletes have been successful within our nations to pull the IOC, WADA, in my case it was the UCI, uh, into uh, civil courts of law in Toronto where we were successful holding them under human rights violations. But I just want to share with you two points. Is one in that process, which I want everybody to be understanding, is the through that three-year process, the IOC did not want to be seen publicly as being involved in these violations. So they were putting pressure on the UCI to take the, the hit for it, um, knowing that they were logistically responsible for those violations through their policies, which I incurred. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention too, because obviously the gender issues are very big in sport right now, what's going on with the IAF and with, and with the issues of water right now, is that you've also got lawyers who are proceeding on, on members of boards of the, of the World Anti-Doping Agency, generating policy without research and science, then implementing them into the sports system under the, under the Olympic movement, violating athletes in, in their sovereign nations, and then, then representing the, uh, going against and representing their clients against the actual vulnerable athletes in the court of arbitration in sport. So there is a tremendous issue of conflict of interest at, 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 at multiple levels. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Moya Dodd. I'm from football. Uh, I used to be on the executive committee when people got arrested. Uh, I'm still on some committees, including the ICAS, but I will make this, uh, ask this question in a personal capacity. Uh, the comments we've heard from this panel and the previous one very much paint a picture of governing bodies as being populated by the privileged and the powerful, of being uh, insulated from uh, their true stakeholders. And I would add that they're also monopolies because by definition a governing body is a monopoly and international federations are associations of, monopoly, uh, of monopolies. And, and when you see monopolies, profits increase, normally people get very upset about that and price regulation and all kinds of regulation follows. Uh, but we see a picture of, of sports bodies being applauded for increasing revenues and, and growing their business when in fact um, they are by nature monopolies. What I wanted to ask is, uh, is this. In response to scandals, we usually see reforms which uh, are written on paper. And that is a first step, of course, but it's the implementation of those reforms which is critical. There's any number of sports federations which talk about non-discrimination, 
they have various measures which are uh, codes of conduct, um, obligations on individuals, but there's very few uh, places for people to go to complain. So my question is, uh, where are the grievance mechanisms and remedies available, and is it time for us to have a WADA for ethics in international sport, where a, a single standard uh, of ethics I applies? Uh, we don't have kind of the patchwork effect of multiple different bodies having different standards, and where uh, a set of remedies is available to all comers, be it reporting abuse, reporting uh, corruption, uh, electoral fraud or, uh, or match fixing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, final question. And I'll be brief. It's a comment as much as a question. I, Minky Warden, Human Rights Watch, I wanted to emphasize what Maggie Murphy said about where there's corruption, there will be human rights abuses. And to say that this was, in fact, the basis of a, the creation of a group called the Sport and Rights Alliance, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative created five years ago. It involves Human Rights Watch, Transparency International, um, uh, our friends and world players, ITUC, Committee to Protect Journalists. The, um, but I wanted to, to tell Professor Spaulding that all of these um, uh, reforms that you've enumerated, uh, for example, the host city contracts for 2024, 2028, and the inclusion of human rights and anti-corruption measures, that's not magic or serendipity. That was a lot of hard work over a period of many years, um, uh, pushing reforms inside the IOC, pushing them inside FIFA. And I think it's that um, uh, the intersection of civil society groups getting together to push these initiatives at the same time there were there was a recognition that sport is fundamentally undermined by human rights abuses or corruption so I, I it's it's uh, many people in the room have been part of that process but I think from the outside it actually might look like magic um, so it's I do think it's important that the sport and rights Alliance um, we've worked very hard on all of these things and um, just wanted to be clear how that happened uh, now the panel will give very, very, uh, I totally agree with that, by the way. <laughs> now the panel will give very brief um, responses and um, I'm being told that it's very, very brief. So down to a couple of sentences with Andy starting. Oh, I, would only I would only underscore that on moving to good faith compliance programs from check the box compliance programs, I think tying back to the Lex Sportiva question, I think the role of government agencies in enforcing compliance requirements uh, is really, really important. Now, not all governments have that, not all, all, all countries have that, but France does, and the role of AFA, the French Anti-Corruption Agency, in implementing um, compliance measures over the next five and a half years, I think is going to be substantial. Um, but then again, so is the OECD. Um, uh, I think I'll, uh, and, and then finally, the civil society, there's no question that needs to be said. Uh, many people in this room, uh, Sylvia, on this panel, uh, hugely instrumental, and, and the anti-corruption movement is a civil society success story, no question about it. Over, over to Sylvia. Well, just briefly, two points. Um, one with regard to, to standards and, and codes and so on. You need that, that's one point, but again, you have to change the culture, and that takes time. And I know it from advising in Germany people in sport, and these are no criminals, and these are not all abusers or whatever. But they don't know what is a conflict of interest. They don't know um, uh, basic governance skills and, and, and other things. And uh, so even in business, we are still at the beginning with compliance, and so it's no wonder that normal people in sport organizations don't know about it. So it's really to change the culture and don't rest if you have the standards and codes and, and regulations in place. That will not be sufficient, and we can talk afterwards how to really go ahead and, and what it needs. And a final sentence, because somebody's called me very ambitious. About 45 years ago, I was fighting for opening more sports for women, allowing them to play football, supporting them to play football, let them run the marathon and whatever. And then one argument from men always was, oh, Mrs. Schenk, do you really want that women make boxing? And they <laughs> tried to kill me by that argument. And I said, well, I'm not a fan of men boxing, but if a woman wants to box, it's not me to prevent her. And in 2012, women boxing was a medal event in the Olympics. 
So I'm not ambitious. I'm just taking my experience of that and transfer it to good governance and human rights and what we achieved already on anti-corruption the last years. I completely take it back and I'm really sorry and let's, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> um, I, we're not going to be able to answer all the questions. I, I really want to echo the cultural thing. I think that's what I was trying to say about the hearts and minds. You can have all the compliance things, uh, you can have all the codes of conduct, all the policies, but unless you genuine, genuinely believe in why you're doing it, it nothing's going to change. Um, Moy, on the question of the water for ethics, I, I think it's a good idea, but I think the trust levels at the moment in sport are not ready for that. Imagine if it was actually a serious proposition. I think the hounds would be all over it. I think we need to get that trust back into the community around sport before we can do that. But then maybe I'm not being ambitious enough. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fair observation. Nicola, to conclude. Yes, just on, uh, on the same question um, and in the same vein of Maggie. There are, in fact, a lot of grievance mechanisms. The problem is that they are not really coordinated. I'm not entirely sure that establishing a one single uh, unit would do the trick, but just to show you that there is movement, and let's try to f end on a positive note. In London last week, we discussed the establishment of a task force under IPEX, and, uh, and the new task force, which would be task force number four, it is not done yet, but if we're looking at, is how to improve the collaboration between international sporting organization and law enforcement in the management of concrete cases. And I think this is where we can make a difference. Yeah. Thank you and over to the boss. <laughs> well, first of all, please thank Colin and the panel.